have you had this experience where a professor, a teacher reads the slides? Yeah, we, a lot of us have had this experience, which from an educational uh, perspective is very, very damaging. It would actually be better if you just gave the slides to the students and sent them home, rather than just sitting there reading the slides. And I don't mean this hypothetically, I mean this like literally, literally. The amount of stuff that you're going to remember. If someone's just reading their slides, it's about 5%, 5 to 10%. If they actually give you the slides, the physical slides, and it's the same as what they're saying, you'll remember about 10 to 20%. Not a lot, but more than if they're just reading off their slides. It's terrible. What else is bad about PowerPoint? <laughs> yes, sir. Exactly. Technical problems that can happen at any time, even if you've checked it a hundred times before. Delays. Yeah, delays and technical problems. Always having a backup is key. It's very teacher-centered oftentimes. If it's not used well, it becomes very, very focused, not even on the teacher. I would say it's technology-centered, where the teacher becomes secondary, and it becomes about a relationship between the students and the PowerPoint, and not the students and each other and the students and the teacher. It can destroy a lot of classroom interaction. Anything else wrong with PowerPoint? Yes, sir. I think it's too much time to make a PowerPoint. It can be very time consuming. It can be very time consuming. But then again, we have to consider if it's used well. We can't just consider our time when we're making a presentation. We have to multiply it by the number of students in the classroom. So I'm thinking, oh, it took me like an hour to make this. But if it's for an hour long presentation, and I have, um, I do audiences of up to 500 people, that's 500 hours of their time. So I think that my hour is worth those 500 hours of their time. So I have to do a little bit of measurement of how long it takes me and not be entirely selfish with my time. I have to really think about my audience. But that's a good point. It can be complicated, absolutely. My other personal uh, problem with it is animations. You'll have people where, uh, there's a quote from Jurassic Park, famous movie Jurassic Park, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And this is the reality about PowerPoint animation. Just because we can use them doesn't mean we should. I had one student, she was doing a presentation, and every bullet point that came out, it was like this, bing, with the bell noise, and then typewriter. Bing, bing. Horrible. It's really annoying when I do it for three seconds. Imagine that for 20 minutes. Horrific, horrific training. These are some actual crime scenes, some actual teacher PowerPoints. Very typical looking. Nice and beautiful. This is by British Council. They have millions of dollars. They should know better. And my favorite part about this slide is the title. It's called Serious Fun. Serious Fun. It doesn't really look that much fun, but you know, we're going to go with it. Engineering students. Oh. Uh, this is from the Toph program in Korea. Oh. So who makes slides this ugly? Who really does this? Haydar does. You'll see him. His slides this afternoon look like that. <laughs> I always feel bad doing this talk first, uh, because inevitably there's somebody, is, is yours looks like that? Yeah, it's, uh, inevitably, there's, there's a few other really good presenters who they're like, um, so I'm sorry, my slide looked exactly like what you told us not to do. But anyway, it's very common, we're all doing it, and of course our buddy Bill Gates from Microsoft does this. This is Bill, and this is his Windows Live 2007 opening slide. Hey Doug, quick question, can you easily understand this slide? No. No, of course not. A lot of you are staring intently, as though it contains the secret of the universe. But it's hard. It's really complicated to understand this quickly. This kind of visual, it might be good in a handout. But from an actual presenter, audience, relationship perspective, it destroys everything. So, why? Number one, PowerPoint is very, very boring. Okay. Now, this doesn't sound like a terribly scientific descriptor. PowerPoint's boring. Your classroom oftentimes will look like this with the PowerPoint up there. But Dr. John Medina says the brain doesn't pay attention to boring things. Simple as that. You're not walking through the streets of Busana. You see something boring and you go, wow, that's so boring. I really want to look at it. Okay? You wouldn't watch TV for five minutes if it was boring you. You change the channel. And yet on a daily basis, we as teachers are putting up slides that we know are boring. If we step back and look at them, gee, that's fascinating. It's not. We put them up there and then we're surprised when the students become predictably very, very boring. Okay, it's very boring. Next up, it's overloaded. 
there's too much information. You guys got this. It's too much text on the screen. And I do mean painfully, painfully, painfully overloaded. Way too much stuff on too small of an area. Three seconds. This is a simple rule. Are you familiar with uh, Nancy Duarte? She did, what's the movie? Inconvenient Truth. Al Gore made a movie called Inconvenient Truth. Have you heard of that movie? Yes. Okay. Now, don't worry about the movie. I'm not caring about the politics. I'm talking about the slides. Okay? The slides in that movie were quite well done, and they were done by a company called Duarte Design, which has done a lot of research on what makes a good slide. Basically, they do uh, brain studies of people watching slides, and they can see where they're looking, how much their focus is going. And what they found, a really simple rule, Richard Mayer's and Duarte Design, is three seconds. What do I mean by three seconds? If your slide takes more than three seconds to understand, it's breaking this connection. Okay? The audience's attention is up there, and it's not here or here. Three seconds. Now, obviously, some of you are going, but what if I want to diagram a complicated sentence? You know, yes, there are exceptions to this rule. But as a general rule, unless you want the audience specifically to be spending more time with something, like you've got directions or something that needs to be longer, we want to keep it short and sweet, really short and sweet. It's a very selfish medium. A classroom should be about you and the students, about the students and each other, building a community. But too often, we put up something like this, and everyone starts reading it. Now, I'm going to tell you that this slide, this slide is meaningless. It has no meaning whatsoever. The text is random gibberish. And half of the audience is still reading the slide, even though it's random. It's a Pavlovian response we have with slides. If there's text up there, we are still reading it. Some people are still reading it. If we have text up there, we're driven to finish it. We're like, must finish the slide. It's like if I started singing happy birthday, happy birthday to, and stopped you in the middle, your brain would hum it the rest of the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're desperately driven to complete what you started. Quick quiz, can you read faster or listen faster? Listen faster. That's a very quick answer, sir. <laughs> Are you certain of this? That's, now that's the gut response. A lot of people go, I can listen faster, obviously. Yep. What's considered a remedial reading speed? Remedial, very basic, low-level reading speed is about 200 words per minute. That's what they consider the, the national education, blah, blah, blah. 200 words per minute, low-level reading speed. Do you know what an average presenter speaking speed is? It's 80 to 150 words per minute. MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., his I Have a Dream speech, he started at 72 words per minute. By the end of the speech, he was speaking about 123 words per minute. What does this mean? The fastest talker, the fastest speaker, someone like me, is still going to be slower than the slowest reader. They will finish reading your slides before you finish talking, no matter how fast you go. And as soon as they're done, the brain is off, wandering away somewhere else. It damages this interaction. So this is the question. Why do we do this when slides don't cost money? Slides don't cost money. Break your points into separate slides. There's no reason not to just copy and paste to a new slide. Simple as that. So who makes slides this ugly? Everybody? <laughs> everybody! Almost everybody does. So the solution, should we just kill PowerPoint? What do you think? <laughs> no, then we, then we have to work. Yeah, no. Uh, not killing PowerPoint. Peter Norvick from Google, he says this. Oh, actually, killing PowerPoint is essentially like blaming the piano. Now, what do I mean blaming the piano? I am terrible at playing the piano. If you listen to me play the piano, it's like John Cage. It's just noise. Lots and lots and lots of noise. It can sound horrific. However, I don't sit there yelling at the piano. It's not the piano's fault that I can't play it. The same is true of PowerPoint. Peter Norvig says about this from Google. My belief is that PowerPoint doesn't kill meetings. People kill meetings. And in a similar manner, my belief is that PowerPoint is not killing classroom interaction. How we as teachers, we as educators are using our PowerPoint is what's damaging the classroom. So why should we use visuals? Second question for you guys, can you just turn to the person next to you? And I want you to brainstorm just for one minute. What's a positive way that we could use visuals in the classroom? Make sense? A good reason why we can use visuals. Just one minute brainstorm with the person next to you, even if you don't like it. Done? Imaginary friend, that will Or you can talk to these guys next to you, I don't know what you need to do. Well, send me a community or something. Help students. Just anywhere.
please find someone? If you have no one next to you, please move and find someone. Doug's lonely here. Here's two lonely souls coming together and talking about PowerPoint. And 
200 calories of peanut butter. If you love peanut butter, I caution you to look away. <laughs> oh, oh, and then, did you hear the noise? Uh, ooh. <laughs> That's the noise we're looking for. That's the power of the visual sense, that we don't get it, we just have data. Data alone. It is true, yeah. Uh, data alone. <laughs> Uh, data alone, data alone is not enough. We need to connect data to something in the real world. We have to give it much more input than that. Use that strong visual sense. Uh, who likes McDonald's milkshakes? Anyone? McDonald's milkshakes? Now, some of you are either lying or you're sober right now. But <laughs> one or the other. But McDonald's milkshakes are my, my guilty pleasure. Uh, I won't drink one again, though. Well, that's a lie. I probably will. Do you know how much sugar's in one of them? One regular milkshake? Again, if you love milkshakes, look away. This is one regular milkshake, not extra large, not American crazy supersized. Regular milkshake, sugar. Oh, that's it? Oh, that's <laughs> it. Imagine eating, imagine eating all of those sugar cubes in five minutes. That's my personal pyramid of shame, okay? And of course, this is why they are an Olympic sponsor, obviously. So, it's also much better for memory. Visuals increase the ability to memorize things. Quick clips here, uh, audience's memory retention. After three days, after three days, your audience with bullet points, they're gonna memorize about 10% of your message. Is that good? I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's not really a very engaging classroom. If we start using appropriate visuals, again, these are general averages, your specific situation will vary, jumps up to about 50%. Huge difference. If you start adding interaction, demonstrations, role plays, games, etc., on top of that, you get up to 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. This is nothing new, okay? This is the old Confucian saying tell me and I'll forget, show me and I'll remember, involve me and I'll understand. Simple, simple thing, but we forget that when we're developing our PowerPoints. So, oh, this is a really quick experiment. If I showed you 2,500 images, 2,500 pictures, in 10 minutes, do you think you can memorize them? <coughs> no, of course not. That's an absurd question. So this is what scientists did. They took an audience and they showed them 2,500 digits in 10 minutes, just flashing the pictures really quickly. After they were done, they showed audience members individually pairs of images, a tree with ornaments, a tree with no ornaments. And they asked the audience member, which one did you see? Now, what did the audience member say? The audience member said, I have no idea which one I saw. You showed me 2,500 pictures. There's no way I could possibly know which one I saw. And so the scientist said, yes, yes. Now, if they were just guessing, just guessing, random chance, how much would they get correct? Yeah, 50-50, of course, you know, yes or no. They were getting how much correct, what do you guys think? around that 80 to 90 percent accuracy. Crazy high accuracy. And this is just designed to show you that even if we're not consciously aware of how much our visual sense is processing, from an evolutionary perspective, our brain's visual sense is massively powerful. It is great at memorizing things visually, even if we're not always aware of it. Now, I'm not suggesting that for your next class, you go in and you have 2,500 images, and you're like, okay, ready, ready? I'm gonna show you 2,000 pictures. You're not gonna really remember it, but you are going to remember it, and you just look through them. That's a terrible class experience. I'm just trying to show you how strong our visual sense is. Massively strong. So, what can we do? What are some simple rules we can follow? What do you guys think? We're designing good visuals. What should we do? Yes? Keep it simple? Yeah, keep it simple. Any other ideas? Color. Color. Well, good colors, hopefully. Yeah. Colors used wisely, not no pink colors. No more than six lines and no more than six words per sentence of death. That is, well, that's actually one of, the, one of the older phrases is that we should keep it to six and three. Uh, Richard Mayer's cognitive research on it has actually shown that it should be even shorter than that. Even shorter than that. That was an old common sense estimation, uh, which was six lines. How many words per line? No more than six. Yeah, no more than six words per line, and no more than how many lines? Six. Yeah, six, six by six, but that still ends up with 36 words, which ends up going over the three-second rule. Uh, but it's, it was the old estimation, and that's actually a good starting point. That would be about halfway to where we want to be, and still a heck of a lot better 
Still a heck of a lot better than where many people are, though. Really good point. Any other ideas? Good rules. Contrast between the background and the wording should be big and the size of letters. Keep it big. Make, people, make sure people can see it. Yeah, you guys have got most of my rules. I'm just going to run through them really quickly. Again, these slides can be downloaded. You don't need to write all this down. Uh, if you came in late, uh, there's a oh, there's a web link that I showed you at the beginning. I'll show you at the end, and it's where you can download all this information. So look, I've been taking notes, but you didn't need to. So first off, think simple. You guys got it perfectly, which is of course kiss and kill. What's kiss stand for? Keep it simple. Or the polite teacherly version, keep it short and simple. Keep it short and simple, or keep it simple, stupid. Uh, kill stands for keep it. I've heard some weird answers for this one. Last time I did this, they said lovely and lacy. Lovely and lazy. Uh, actually, I want large and legible. Large and easy to read, okay? This means, of course, simple, clean fonts. You don't want crazy scripted fonts. Uh, for sizes, which is better, small or big? Keep it big, but you know, there isn't a rule about sizes. Think about the scale of your classroom. If you've got a huge classroom, you want it bigger. Smaller classroom, you can shrink it down a little bit. You know, there is not one set where you must use 38 or 40 or 80 point font. This is up to, I believe, this is like 180, 240 point font. Big. Colors, of course. Angus's favorite thing. Is this a good color scheme, Angus? Yeah, now that's horrific. Hard to see for the audience. Images on the uh, left here. Good or bad? The robes. Good. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is Microsoft what? Clip art. Clip art is the devil. <laughs> Please, I beg of you, I beg of you, never, ever, 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 ever use clip art. If you're teaching elementary school, middle school students, and you want to use cartoon images, I do understand that in middle school, elementary school, sometimes we want cartoon images. On the resource page, uh, the web link that I gave you at the beginning, I'll also show you at the end, I have links to various cartoon generators where you can make your own custom cartoon images for your classroom. So there's no reason to fall back on this terrible clip art, which looks like it came from some sort of horrible, horrible 1970s flyer. It just is very dated, and it's just not interesting. It's cliche. What about the one on the right? Better? Terrible? So-so? It looks alive. It looks alive. That's funny, someone actually told me it looked like a dying man, a tiny man. But I've heard weird things. Uh, it's a jumping man, a dying man, a man-shaped island, which was the weirdest one. Um, it's okay, it's better than this, but there's a couple of problems with it. It's vague, of course, we don't know the situation. But also, uh, what if it's small? We're not using the full medium. We've got this huge screen, why shrink it down like this? Okay, use the full medium. Number two, it's cliche. We've seen this kind of jumping, happy image before. I do a lot of business presentations, and a lot of times the participants, their first slide, it's the happy businessmen shaking hands across the table, and these kind of images become cliche. Okay. Salvador Dali said that the first person to compare a rose uh, to a woman's cheek was a genius. The second person to copy it was an idiot. <laughs> okay? So this is the idea that the first time someone does something, it's unique, it's original, it has impact on our audience. But if we see the same image again and again, even if it's prettier stock imagery, it becomes boring. Stock imagery is quickly becoming the clip art of the 21st century. And we have to be careful about that. Go big. Go big or go home. Really, go big or go home. That's really the key here. Uh, as far as graphs go, good or bad? What do you think? Perfect, yeah. Good or bad? This is actually from Gar Reynolds, if anyone knows him, Presentation Z. This is his before image. Complicated, hard to understand. This is his after image, cleaning it up, keeping it simple. Uh, my one key idea here. Sometimes you have complicated charts, sentence diagrams, complicated things you want to explain. I beg of you, the one thing I really ask, don't show it all at once. I do a lot of business presentations, they've got these huge charts, and they're showing the whole thing right from the very first second. And then they're waiting, no, 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 just look at this part now. No, just look at this part now. There's no reason not to break into separate slides. Imagine this is a chart or a graph or something. We show the first important point, we move on to the second, and it becomes highlighted, the third it becomes highlighted, the fourth it becomes highlighted, and then we show the whole picture. Gradually building, as we go along, as we talk, it becomes a natural part of our flow. It becomes connected with what we're 
we're saying. At a minimum, if you're still in the bullet point era, if you still have lots of bullet points, at a minimum, please don't show all your bullet points at the very beginning. Please have everything slowly revealing. That's not all the way where I want to get you, but it's better than where we are where we're showing everything at the first moment. Because this way we're focusing on point at a time. So, think showing. If I was going to do a, a talk about how much people eat around the world, comparing USA, uh, Ethiopia, and Japan, I could actually show you the data. I could say they eat this much food here, this much food here, and your students would be interested or bored. I think we're overestimating our students' interest there. They're probably bored if we just gave them the data and the numbers. But if we show them, this is actually from a UN National Geographic partnership thing. This is how much people eat in a week in Japan. Oh, and instantly you're like, woo, you hear the noises. That's not what we want, the response. Let's compare it to Ethiopia. Well, that's not the shocking one. The shocking one's the next one, USA. Compare to USA. If you're from USA, again, I would look away. USA. Oh. What I like about this image is this is the fruits and vegetables. It's like the, the eye in the middle of a store. A store with fast food, and we've got this little tiny healthy section. So, yeah. And some people are getting very hungry right now. Very, very hungry. So, this idea of showing. And of course, a presentation is not about sharing everything you know. In the classroom, you guys know a lot. You're experts in your fields. Hopefully, we all know something. But one of the biggest things that we try and do as teachers is we try and share too much in too short of a time. Back in the old days, when you had to write everything on the board, you know, nice and slowly, writing on the board, it kept us to a reasonable speed, okay? It wasn't always amazing and entertaining, but it kept us slow. PowerPoint, it lets us go really quickly through lots and lots of information. Now, we already know the topic, so we can do it. We think, oh, we understand it, so obviously they would. But that's not the reality. We're going faster than our students can actually process the information. So, finally, think interaction. The easiest one, of course, is this. And suddenly, everyone looks at me. Why? There's no picture up there, of course. This is actually, there is a picture up here. It's a black slide. The easiest trick in the world, inserting a black slide into your presentation, kills the visual sense and focuses right back on the teacher. But oftentimes we never do this. Even if we're not using what's up there, we have something shiny in the background. And part of our human brain is always focused on the shiny thing. So we really want to use this black slide to kill and refocus, okay? Keeping it one slide, one idea, will keep it at a very slow and reasonable pace. So the key being, of course, communicate, don't decorate. Really, really. Slides are good for three things. Three Q's and three S's. Slides are really good for giving quizzes to your students, little questionnaires like what did you learn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're good for quotes, big, big, famous quotes, and they're good for, of course, questions. Asking questions to your students, key questions. Three S's, they're good for, any ideas? Signposting, signposting. Signposting is where you break things up into sections, first point, second point, third point. They're good for signposts, they're good for summaries, a yo yak at the end, and they are good for showing, demonstrating things. These six things, slides are very good for. Being my script, being everything I want to say up there, it's not very good for that. As long as you're keeping to these six, it'll keep it simple, it'll keep it clean. So, that is the end, actually, of the theory talk. Uh, do I have any words? Grab them. I just run away. We started a bit late. If you've got a few minutes, I was going to show a few actual activities. Lyndon, are you going to get them? What time is the, Who's the next speaker? Okay, I'll... Right. If you'd like to, oh, you'd like to, would you like to see a few practical activities? Yes or no? Okay, we're going to go for it then. So this is, again, it's normally an hour and a half talk. It collapse it down. That's all the theory behind it. I want to show you a few practical things. For that, I need some volunteers, though. Four people. Well, now you're wishing you said no. So one, excellent. Two, excellent. Good. Three, excellent. And four. Come on, guys. Give them a clap. And just have a little line, a little tunnel over there. A little bit of over there. Okay. So we're going to start off with some uh, sample activities and further resources, which I'll show you at the end. We're going to start off with something called PowerPoint Collaborative Stories. What's key about all these activities 
is you said, sir, that uh, PowerPoint can take a long time to make. It doesn't have to. Other teachers design all the activities I'm going to show you next. And I didn't steal it from them. They're actually, I went to their classrooms and I stole their slides. These are actually taken from teacher resource sharing websites. All these resource sites are linked to on the link that I gave you at the beginning and I'll give you at the end. There's no reason always to rebuild the wheel. Take the existing resources that are shared by other teachers, add to them yourself, and utilize them as a way to shortcut the long PowerPoint design process. So this is a really simple one. Uh, what's your name? Matt. Matt. Matt is going to start telling a story. The story is going to be about whatever is on the screen. I'm going to give Matt the remote so he will control when it goes forward. Okay. Are you ready? Now this is, gets more interesting. Uh, you're going to have to connect the story together. So he doesn't know what the next picture is, but when he changes the slide, he has to connect the two things together. Uh, now, Matt, like many second language learners, Matt may panic. When he panics, he can pass the remote to the next student. And the next student, Peter, needs to continue Matt's story. And it keeps continuing, continuing, continuing. Now, I've chosen random photos, because these are advanced language learners. Depending on the level of your learners, you can have photos that are matching the theme of your week. If they're very low level, you can actually have sample phrases, sample words they can use at the bottom of the screen to help them along. This can be adjusted to many levels. It took no time to create. I just actually went to uh, SlideShare, which is YouTube for PowerPoints, and I downloaded an Images of the Year kind of SlideShare. So, are you ready for this? Now, Matt's ready for this, he's a good teacher. Uh, in the harder version of this, I would actually give the remote to another student and let them torture each other, which is quite fun uh, for me. So, let's give Matt a clap. Of, of 
Squidward and SpongeBob talking to each other. Simple as this, you two are going to have a dialogue, conversation. About what? About whatever you think the people on screen are talking about. You, Peter, are always going to be the person on the left. Angus will always be the person on the right. Now, with students, we would, with lower level students, we would change from scene to scene. Maybe the two people are talking in the kitchen, then they're moving to um, the living room, whatever. These guys, your background is going to be a bit more complicated changing, of course, but you will always be the one on the left, you're the one on the right. Just roll with the conversation. Does that make sense? You'll see how it works. Let's give them a clap. Good luck. Go for it. You know, it's really hard to get socks in these sides. You know, like, it's just so annoying. That's not what I want to talk about. That's not why I brought you here. <laughs>
go to the next person's slot. Uh, but there are lots of these activities. Lots of them. On the resource page, which I'm going to fast forward to real quick. Let me just get that web link up there again. On this web link, I put up a ton of resources for you guys. Uh, better tools you can use, where to get good images for your classrooms, where to get PowerPoint games you can use in classrooms, all sorts of possible resources that you can use to take your PowerPoint, to take your visual design that you're using now, and transform it into something better. Now the key points to this is, number one, it's easy to do. I completely understand people go, oh, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time, which is true, we often don't. But other teachers have created great resources that you can actually use in your classroom with small adjustments. Okay. Number two, they'll make you look good. Okay? These will make you look good in your classroom, uh, which is good for your relationships with co-teachers, if you have co-teachers. It's also good for relationships with your own students. And number three, most importantly, using these types of visual techniques will actually increase the interaction and the educational value of your classroom. And that's, of course, the most important thing. It's not just that it's easy, it's not just that it makes us look better, but it's better for our students, and we owe it to them, to their time, to their education, to actually take this step. So, thank you guys very much.